Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in the United Kingdom. And today we're going to be discussing case number 43 from our Facebook page. Has been a while actually since we've uh, last discussed the case and this case has been uh, on my desktop for a while and it's an interesting one. So I thought let's go back and uh, go through it. Today we're going to talk about a 42 years old female patient presented to ED with intermittent palpitations. Uh, she's had mild shortness of breath uh, and that was all of an acute onset a few hours before presentation. There was no previous medical history at all to worry about. The, her observations were all okay apart from a heart rate that was on the slow side. So she's had an ECG and uh, this was her ECG. So what I want you to do now is I want you to click the pause button, have a proper look at this ECG, try to analyze it yourself and let's see what you think about it. Okay, so um, let's now analyze the ECG together and see what we can get out of it. We've talked about this before and it's always about having a clear approach a systematic one when it comes to ECG interpretation. And the suggested approach that we've used before and we're gonna keep using is the following one. Always start looking at the QRS complex and ask yourself four questions. What's the rate doing? What's the rhythm doing? What's the width like? And what's the axis? Then have a look at the P wave and its relation to the QRS. Then have a look at the intervals and the two important intervals that I'm interested in are the PR interval and the QT interval. Then check for chamber enlargements, both atria and uh, ventricular enlargement. And then have a look at the ischemia signs, looking at the ST segment, T waves and Q waves. And finally, anything else. So if we apply this approach to our ECG, Let's see what we can come up with. So starting from the rate, looking at the rate in here, it's kind of 35, 37. And, uh, and looking at the rhythm, it looks quite regular to my eyes. And looking at the width, the complex here is narrow. And uh, looking at the axis, it looks normal to me. So, so far, the abnormality we have in here is just a slow, Right. Moving on to cover the P waves and the intervals we've talked about, then the enlargement, then ischemia. Uh, we're going to leave the P wave and intervals for a second and uh, check for enlargements. And actually, there are no signs of left ventricular enlargement or right ventricular enlargement or uh, atrial enlargement. And from the ischemia point of view, we haven't got any ST changes that are of notice here and um, we've got T wave inversions in V1, V2, V3 and um, and T wave inversion in lead 3, uh, maybe in AVF and uh, nothing else to notice in this ECG. So that would leave us with the P waves and the intervals. So let's talk about these with more details in here. So this ECG is really important and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it into two halves, the chest leads part and the limb leads part. And let's analyze both of them separately. Starting with the chest leads part, we can clearly see that we've got a P wave here that's followed by a complex and the PR interval looks OK. Same in here. So P wave followed by a complex, P wave followed by a complex and the PR interval is normal it's the same it's fixed so i would call this part of the ecg uh just sinus brady so that's regarding the chest leads part moving on to the limb leads part this is where the interesting bit is there is no clear p wave before this complex and actually there is this thing in here so that's the p wave just after the complex moving on no p waves before the complex we've got the complex followed by a P wave. This is a T. Then again, nothing before the complex and then the complex followed by this P wave. 
and in this one actually there is no p wave in here and there is that slurred upstroke of the complex that is actually a p wave that's merged with the complex let's make things bigger so looking at the uh, rhythm strip in here this is part of the chest leads part that we've seen before and as we can see we've got clearly p wave followed by a complex p wave followed by a complex p wave followed by a complex same pr interval normal pr interval so sinus bradi and this is the part of the limb leads that we've seen before and in this one we can clearly see that we've got a p wave after the complex p wave after the complex p wave after the complex and then this p wave that is merged with the complex to come up with this thing and if we map out the p waves we will find that actually they are mapping regularly nicely so this the pp interval is regular so I guess most of you now can guess what we're talking about and uh, what we're going to talk about in this case is the junctional rhythms. So let's start with what's normal first so we can uh, figure out the abnormalities and analyze it. Let's start with this normal heart. So this is our uh, both atria, both ventricle. SA node is here in the right atrium. AV node is here in the right atrium, then we got the bundle of his, left bundle branch, right bundle branch, left bundle split it into anterior and posterior fascicles. So normally what happens is the SA node is our pacemaker. So the SA node starts to fire the impulse that spread through the um, atrial walls, then to reach the AV node, then the AV node will cause a bit of a delay there. So in the ECG world, that will be in the form of a P wave, that's the atrial depolarization, then the PR interval, which represents the delay that happens in the AV node, followed by the stimulation of the ventricle, that's the QRS complex, then the T wave. So this is what happens normally. Um, so the reason for the PR interval, so from here to there, is the travel time within the atrial wall and the AV nodal delay. This is normal. So what happens in with junctional rhythms then? What happens is, let's go back to our heart. So again, we've got our SA node in here. We've got our AV node in here. Then that's the bundle of his right and left bundle branches. So for some reason, the, AV no the SA node starts to slow down significantly and decides not to fire. So what happens then is somewhere else in the heart will need to take over so we can still survive. So when the SA node's rate goes down, somewhere else will take over and it's usually this bit around the AV nodal area and the bundle of his area. So when they take over, then what will happen is the firing will start from here, which means that the stimulation of the atrium will happen kind of simultaneously with the stimulation of the ventricle. Because we're traveling through the normal pathway going down the bundle of his all the way down to stimulate the atrium, uh, the ventricles, the, com the resulting complex will be normal. So if we start drawing this in the ECG world, what will happen is stimulation of the atrium will happen either just before the complex, so it will be kind of with a very short PR interval, or actually in the same time, the stimulation will be up and down. So actually the P wave will be hidden within the complex. So we've got, we'll get no P waves, or actually it will happen shortly after the stimulation of the ventricle. So it will be kind of a complex followed by a P wave. So this is what happens with the junctional rhythm. So talking about the junctional rhythms, they've got typically regular regular rhythms with narrow complexes and they're named according to the ventricular rate. So if the ventricular rate is less than 40, they're called junctional bradi. 
if the rate is from 40 to 60, they're called junctional escape rhythm. And if the rate is from 60 to 100, it's called accelerated junctional rhythm. We've covered this rhythm, by the way, before when we talked about reperfusion arrhythmias uh, in STEMIs. And if the rate is above 100, it's called junctional tachy. The P waves are usually just before the complex, as uh, we've mentioned, or actually completely absent because they'll be hidden within the complex uh, or just after the complex. There are so many causes for the junctional uh, rhythms. The common ones are either severe bradyhypnosis or sick sinus syndrome. It can happen with acute ischemia. It can happen with the second degree of a block or the third degree of a block. Obviously, hyperkalemia can cause anything in the ECG, and um, and most of the rate controlling drug can result into this. So, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or digoxin toxicity. So, these are some of the causes that can result in junctional rhythms. So going back to our patient, so this is another ECG of the same patient. And uh, we can clearly see here that the PR intervals are changing. Let's make the rhythm strip bigger and have a look at it. So uh, starting from the beginning, we've got what looks like a normal PR interval. Then this PR interval looks shorter to me. Then we've got a completely merged P with a complex here. Then back to P complex, but with short PR interval. Then kind of a normal PR interval. Then again, merged within the complex. So with that change in the PR interval and that slow rate, you should consider junctional rhythm. So how do we treat this? Well, it depends upon the cause. It's treating the underlying cause. That's the treatment. And uh, by the way, it's, um, this condition has got a really good prognosis. And in healthy asymptomatic individuals, this will need absolutely no treatment. It's purely just a high vagal tone for some reason. But you can consider giving atropine in some cases, especially if they're symptomatic. So let's go back to our female patient who presented to us with some symptoms and an ECG that is suggestive for a junctional bradyhypnosis. So this was the ECG that she presented with. Uh, the, our diagnosis was a uh, junctional bradyhypnosis. So um, because she was symptomatic, we've decided to give her some atropine and see where, what will happen next. So she received some atropine and less than a minute later, she turned into this. So basically just sinus bradyhypnosis then the heart rate started gradually to increase to normal sinus rhythm with absolutely no problems. Her symptoms shortly after completely resolved. She's had um, her blood results back and everything was normal. We've just observed her in ED for a while and uh, it's been discussed with a cardiology consultant who was happy with her to go home uh, with a plan of an outpatient follow-up. So this was the outcome of this case. So in summary, um, be systematic when you interpret any ECGs. And um, as long as you're going through a systematic approach, no matter what the approach is, just find one and follow it, then um, you're not going to miss anything important. When it comes to the differential diagnosis of the short PR interval, this is something that we've talked about before. And, um, and we said that's either you've got a pacemaker that is very close to the AV node, or the bundle of his, so that's why the PR interval is short. This is what happens with junctional rhythm, or actually you're bypassing the AV node via an accessory pathway. So your differential is either pre-excitation syndrome when you bypass the AV node, or you've got junctional rhythm. So there are types of junctional rhythms, and it's all about the rate. So if it is below 40, then that's junctional bradyhypnosis. If it is from 40 to 60, that's junctional escape rhythm. If it is from 60 to 100, that's an accelerated junctional rhythm. And if it is above 100, this is junctional tachy. So the treatment for junctional rhythm is primarily treatment of the underlying cause. And the prognosis is usually got by it's all about the underlying cause. So if it is sick sinus syndrome, for, for example, then uh, you might need um, to um, treat with a pacemaker. 
Um, if it is just a high vagal tone, maybe some atropine can help. If it is asymptomatic in a healthy individual, then you need absolutely no treatment. And this was it about this case. So I uh, hope you found this useful and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.